little tired, first full day. All right. All right, well, I'm going to try to keep it short and sweet tonight because I know you guys are exhausted and tired. But I do want to take a moment. I just want us to, to, to settle for a moment uh, and find a little bit of space right now in this moment just to take a deep breath and just kind of focus in. Take some deep breaths, just settle into this moment real quick. We'll spend a few minutes. I just want to share a little bit of what God's put on my heart for tonight. And then we'll see what he wants to do during ministry time. Is everybody good with that? So last night was exciting. We talked about knowing Jesus. And again, not just information, not just head knowledge, but actually entering into a lifelong journey of knowing him, walking with him, following him. And it was so cool. Last night, a number of you decided to believe and to follow Jesus last night. So amen for that. Praise God for that. That was awesome. So tonight, I want to talk about becoming who God created you to be. Becoming who God has created you to be. You know, if we're honest with ourselves, what we're all looking for, what we all desire is we desire significance. We desire to make a lasting impact. I think that's a part of being a follower of Jesus is we recognize what God's done in our life and so we wanna give that away. We want other people to experience some of the life-giving things that God has done in our own life. So I don't think by any means wanting significance, wanting to, to make a lasting impact, none of that is wrong, but we do have to be careful because if we don't understand, if we don't become first, if we don't understand our identity in Christ first, then we will spend our entire life doing to try to become. Let me say that again. If we aren't careful, if we don't understand our identity, if it's not secure in Jesus, if we don't have an intimate relationship with him, if we don't understand our identity in Christ, then we will spend our entire life do, trying to do all these great things for, for God in order to become. And God designed for us to become who he's created us to be and then do the things he's called us to do. It's from that place of identity that we, we step out and we see God move. It's from that place of identity and security and, and who we are in him that we move in power. We see his kingdom come and break in. We don't do those things as if we're trying to earn something from God. We do it because we have learned to love and God has, learned to, has showed us what it's like to be loved by him. So we, we, we give from a place of understanding who we are and from that place of love. And so I want to talk uh, about identity tonight. What is our identity in Christ? What is our identity in the world? What does it mean? But in order to do that, I really have to define a couple of things that identity isn't. So number one, identity is not what we do. Our identity is not what we do. For me, this was a big problem in my life. I, I thought that I, whatever I was good at, whatever I thought my significance and my identity would be tied directly to the things that I was good at. But our identity is not tied to our successes and our failures. Our identity is, uh, number two, our identity is not what people say we are. For me, that, again, that was another issue. I'm kind of a people pleaser. I, I'm, I want... Uh, people's affirmation. I want to know that I'm doing a good job. I want to be. I want to know that that I'm getting. I'm. I'm. You know, pleasing people, and people are proud of me, and all those kind of things. And and that's a very dangerous thing. And I promise you, on your journey to understanding who you are in God, you're going to have to face something that's called fear of man. You know, last night we talked about fear of God, that awe and reverence of who God is, realizing that we're different than He is. But there's something that we have to face as we, as we are on a journey and, and through the process of becoming who God's created us to be. We have to face this thing called fear of man. We have to understand, we have to, we have to understand that there is an opportunity for us to choose to believe what God says about us over what anybody else speaks over us. And one of the things I think God wants to do tonight in your life is that some of you have been labeled and, and spoken things over you. People have, have, have given and spoken over your identity, and some of you are out in a false reality, a false identity that has nothing to do with God's plan over your life. And I feel like tonight, one of the things God wants to do is erase some of those labels over your life and reestablish and reaffirm who you are in him. And then the third thing that I, our identity is not, and it does not come from what the world says we should be. 
You know, the world tells us we should look like this. We should be like this. We should act like this. And our identity is not attached to what the world says our identity is attached to. So I want you to think for a moment, and this is a rhetorical question, so don't answer it, but I want you to ponder for a moment. Why did God create us? Why did God choose to create us? Was it because God just wanted constant worship of him? No, I don't think so. I think it's amazing to worship God. I think that it's one of the honors and privileges we have is to to worship God with our lives. But I don't think that that was the chief reason why he created us. Was it for us just to be his servants, kind of like an army to carry out the things that he wants us to do for him? No, I don't think so. God's all-powerful. He could do whatever he wants to with a snap of his finger. Although there are incredible things that God has for us to do, that's not why God created us. I believe that God created us because he wanted us to be his sons and daughters. He created us because he looked at us and said, I choose you as my sons and my daughters. He wants a relationship with you, a fatherly relationship with you. And he speaks over you, you're my son, you're my daughter with whom I'm well pleased. Romans 8, 15 says this, So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. We're not mindlessly serving God out of fear that he's going to strike us down. Instead, we receive a, uh, God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit and affirms that we are God's children. Your, your place of identity, your greatest place of identity is not what people say about you. It's not what you accomplish or what you do. It's in the fact that the Father God looks at you and calls you his sons and daughters. That's what your identity is. And you are meant to uh, understand and step into the reality of what it is to be a son and a daughter of God. For me and my life, one of the greatest tools God gave me to be able to understand what it is uh, to, to truly be a son was when I became a father. See, when I became a father, the nurse, the nurse hands you this slimy, alien-looking thing, right? And you hold it for the first time, and when you look at it, you behold and you, and you realize in that moment that there isn't anything in this world I wouldn't do for this little thing. You have a love for this child. And up until this point, this baby has done nothing except cause your wife a lot of pain, which she blames you for. And, and, and this baby that you take home is going to make you exhausted. You won't sleep, and you think, how am I going to live without sleep? Will it ever sleep? And when it sleeps, you're, you're awake. And when it's awake, you're trying to sleep. It's miserable. But when you look each time your eyes behold the child, you just love it so much. There's a love that's just, it's unexplainable. And that child has done nothing to earn that love. That child has done nothing. There's, there, the child has done nothing to benefit you. But it's your child. You love it, and you've chosen to be its parent and to walk through life and to nurture and to protect it. That's what it's like. Father God is looking at us, and you know, there is nothing that we can do that can impress God. Nothing. But when he looks at us, he looks at us with this incredible affection. And he said, this is my son. This is my daughter. I choose you. So your place of significance isn't what you will accomplish for God. It's simply that you're his. That's where your identity is. You know, in this season, and again, I talked about last night how knowing God is this lifelong journey. Becoming who God's created you to be is, is really a process. And you're going to find out something as, in, as you follow God. You're going to realize that God, God's not really in a hurry. I, let me say it like this. God doesn't work on your timetable. 
There's going to be a lot of times in your life you're, you're waiting on, like, God, come on, like, just can you just do this? Let's get this over with. Can you move me from this season to the next? How many of you are in that place where you're getting ready to graduate next year, and you're like, God, let's just hurry up and get this over with? Or, or maybe towards the end of school, you're like, God, can we just get this over with? Can we get this school year over? Or maybe it's, maybe it's in the season where you're getting ready to drive. Come on, let's just get to the point where I can drive. We're constantly looking to move forward in life. And it's interesting that a lot of times God doesn't work on our timetable. And so becoming who God's created us to be is a, is a process. And oftentimes God works in seasons. In fact, a great way to kind of dialogue with God is to ask God, God, what season am I, am I in? What are you wanting to do in this season? What are you trying to show me in this season? And it, it's a great dialogue. And one of the seasons that we enter into as we become who God's created us to be is a season where he releases calling and vision for our life. And again, it's around this time where we realize that we're sons and we're daughters. And it's because God wants us to do some incredible things. He understands that there's significance. He wants, us to, he wants us to share in that significance. He's fine with that. God is completely okay with us stepping into a calling and doing incredible things for him and things that last. He desires it. It's like, it's like for me as a father, I desire to see my kids grow up and do incredible things, enjoy life and watch them do incredible things for God. Father God's the same way. He has things he wants us to do. So oftentimes in this season, he releases calling. But it's so important in this season as he releases calling that we realize that we really have to develop a rhythm in our life so that we remain secure in our identity as sons and daughters. And we see this all throughout the Bible. And even in my own life, during this season of becoming who God created me to be and understanding what it was to be a son. God released a calling in my life. In fact, it wasn't too much longer after that vision I was talking about last night that I had. It was probably six months to maybe even a year where I was actually at a Southeast Vineyard um, uh, conference. And I remember sitting there and I was listening to pastors and they were sharing, you know, their vision and, and what they were doing for their city and what their dream was for their city. And in that moment, I heard a little whisper from God. And he said, Bryn, one day you're going to be a pastor. One day you're going to plant a church. It was just a little whisper. It was almost as if God was just, just barely speaking into the moment. And I remember later that night talking through that with my wife and saying, hey, I think I'm supposed to, we're supposed to plant a church. And she felt the same way. And, and that was a moment in our life where God released a calling. It was something that he wanted us to do in the future. One thing we have to understand is we cannot rush into trying to do the things God's calling us to do. We have to embrace the process of becoming. Embrace the process of preparation. I want to share real quick about two people in the Bible that developed a rhythm in their life that kept them connected to the Father, that kept them t connected to their identity. The first person is David. Remember, King David was anointed by Samuel. God told Samuel, go to the house of Jesse, and from one of his sons, I will choose a king. And so Samuel went to Jesse's house and Jesse called all of his sons, and there were seven sons up there, and every one of them looked like the picture of what the world would think a king should look like. And one by one, Samuel said, is it this one? And God said, no. Is it this one? God said, no, until every single son had gone, had gone by. And Samuel's going, what is going on? And God said, see, you look with your eyes as a human, and, and you look at the outward appearance, but what I'm concerned about is the heart. And it's because in our heart, in a place of intimacy with God, our heart is developed and formed. And so Samuel said, is, is, there, is there any other sons that you have? And his father said, yeah, actually, I got one more. He's the run of the litter. He's the youngest one, the forgotten kid. He's out in the field tending my sheep. And so he says, well, call him. And so he calls him, and, and then God said, that's him. That's David. In that point in David's life, he was insignificant. Even to his own father, he was insignificant. But for some reason, he caught the eye of God. And here's why. 
Because while David was in the field, he developed an intimacy with God. He developed his identity and who he was with God. In fact, we know that even when he later takes on Goliath and King Saul says, how are you going to defeat this guy? And he says, the same way that when a lion would come to attack the sheep, I would defend it and by the hand of God kill it. Or when a bear came one time and I fought it off and killed it. See, it was in the field where God developed David into a king. That later, that his own son Jesus would come from the line of David. And in fact, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, the only person he quoted was David. David came from a place of insignificance. But because in that place, in the field, in a secret place, in an intimate place with God, he developed his identity so that he could step into the significance of his calling. And over and over we see in his life, later on it would be the cave where he would run and hide and get alone with God. He had developed a rhythm of intimacy with the Father because it's in that intimate place that God continues to reveal his Father's heart over us. The second person, and then I'm going to close, was Jesus. Think about this for a moment. Jesus, the Son of God, lived a life of insignificance for 30 years. Think about that. There's little that we know about Jesus other than his birth and a little scene in the temple from that point all the way to the point where he steps into the waters of baptism at John the Baptist when he was around 30 years old. For 30 years, Jesus seemingly lived in its insignificance. But what did he do in that time? He developed an intimate relationship with the Father. He was so connected to the Father that it said that he could only do what he saw his Father doing. He was so connected to the Father that he says, I can only speak what I hear my Father speaking. Imagine the intimacy there. Imagine how he understood that he was the Son of God, and that was developed in a secret place, in a place of intimacy with God. That's where his identity was secured as son. So that later when, they, when Satan tempted him and attacked his identity, each time he was secure in his identity. Later when people would spit on him and mock him and hang him on a cross, he was so secure in his identity that he looked at them and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. The most significant human to ever walk the face of the earth was secure in his identity as son. And we see that rhythm in his life. Real quick, Luke 5, 15 says, But now even more, the report about him went abroad. And great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. This is only chapter 5 in Luke, very early on in Jesus' ministry life. And we see that already he's become significant to the crowds. People are following him. People are coming to see what he's doing. He's healing all kinds of people, delivering all kinds of people. And at which point, if, if, if it was me, I'd be thinking, man, this is amazing. My ministry's taken off. This is incredible. Look at the thousands of people coming. But what does Jesus do in this moment? It says, verse 16, but he would withdraw to a desolate place to pray. There was a rhythm in Jesus' life that he recognized, yes, what I'm doing, advancing the kingdom, what I'm doing, seeing people healed, set free and delivered. Yes, that is my father's business, but there's something more important than, than that. My significance doesn't come from that. My significance comes from understanding my connection to the father, that my identity is son. Guys, if you want to be significant in your life, if you want to do great things for God, I hope that you pray a prayer that says, God, don't let me ever do anything significant until I'm secure as a son or a daughter. It's one of the most dangerous things we can do. And when we step out into the things that God's calling us to do, I promise you're going to be challenged. I promise people are going to speak things about you. I promise you're going to encounter resistance. And the only way that you're going to be able to step into the fullness of what God has created you to be is when you can sit in the reality that you're a son and that you're a daughter. And that your significance isn't in what you do. Your significance isn't in what people say about you. Your significance is in the fact that the God of the universe looks at you and says, I love you. I love you. You're my child.
Let's pray. Jesus, we just thank you so much that you died on the cross, that you paved the way for us so that we could receive your Holy Spirit. And by doing that, we step into adoption and we become sons and daughters of God. And God, in this moment, I ask right now that your kids would realize their significance is in the fact that you love them exactly where they're at, exactly what they're doing. You love them right where they're at. And that you have great plans for them, you have destiny for them, but the greatest understanding they can have is that they're a son and that they're a daughter.